on this, the August 10th, 2022 edition of What the Ship. White House Port Envoy says nation's entire supply chains need 24-7 operations. We head to the Black Sea and the issue with Ukrainian export grain. Next, container shipping lines set to smash profit record for the second half of 2022. We see the strongest tanker market in 25 years, and China and Taiwan engage in military exercises. All this on today's episode. I'm your host, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to this episode of What the Ship. If you're new to the episode and new to this channel, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Well, we're back in North Carolina. For those of you who took a wild guess at where I was, and it wasn't that hard based on the last episode of What the Ship, you were correct. I was in Hawaii. Matter of fact, specifically the island of Kauai is where I was at when I filmed the last What the Ship episode. Again, I was celebrating my 30th wedding anniversary with my wife, took our son out there, and we did some island hopping over to uh, from Oahu to Kauai, over to Maui, and just got back in yesterday. So a little bit of jet lag, but wants to read another reason why this video is a little late getting out today. But back in, had a great time, and a great opportunity actually to look at shipping and supply chain issues around Hawaii, even on vacation. I can't get away from it. Uh, just a couple of updates on some stories. So posted a video on military sea lift command and how 20% of the ships uh, of the U.S. Navy are manned and crewed by civilian merchant mariners. Got a lot of response back from it, uh, both in the comment sections from those who sail, those who didn't know anything about the subject. But I think the really the most interesting one I got back was a comment from one of the senior leaders at Military Sealift Command who told me that I needed a refresher course on Military Sealift Command, telling me that he did not like my video very much. On the flip side of that, I got a very great note from a former commander of Military Sealift Command who said my video was spot on. So current command, not crazy with the video. Previous commanders, those who sail with Military Sealift Command, very happy with the video. I'm going to call it a win and keep trucking from there. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our stories for today. we got a lot going on this week. Story number one is a Bloomberg story over on G-Captain. Uh, Stephen Lines, who former commander of the U.S. Transportation Command, general in the U.S. Army, has been appointed to replace John Bakari as the Biden administration's port envoy. And in this story uh, by Bloomberg, they interviewed General Lyons. And one of the things he's talking about is the need for 24-7 operations, but not just in the ports. So my most popular video I've ever done on this channel, almost a half a million hits on this video, was back in September of last year, where I basically called bullshit on the 24-7 call by the Biden administration for the ports to go 24-7. And I sat there and said, this is going to do nothing. It, it's just not. Number one. The ports are not going to go 24-7, and uh, they haven't. But the issue here isn't so much getting the ports go 24-7, it's getting everything else to go 24-7, because it does you no good to have the ports running 24-7 if they cannot receive cargo from the ports. And one of the issues that is very difficult for a lot of people to understand is that it's not just a matter of having what you would think is the biggest shippers, for example, opening up their facility. So, you know, if you get Walmart and Amazon, even if you get the top 20 shippers out there or top 10 for that matter, they only represent a very small percentage actually of the overall cargo coming in and out of the United States because cargo is diffuse among many operators. But one of the things we see here is, is the issue of 24 seven still generates, but the problem is getting everything else going. And one of the things that was interesting was a quote here by Stephen Lyons to the Port of Long Beach Executive Director, Mario Car uh, Cadero. If you only or only a terminal goes to 24 seven, that's interesting. But if everything, including warehouse communities, all the other modes of transport move to 24 seven or something more than today, that makes logistical sense since you can move much more cargo in the same period of time. Now, it, it's interesting. It's those two who are saying that. Because Mario uh, Cadero, who is the head of the Port of Long Beach, was actually a commissioner on the Federal Maritime Commission. And back in 2015, they did an extensive report, did a whole video on it. You can catch it up here on the issue of potential bottlenecks in the supply chain. And one of the things that Mario identified clearly 
was this potential for a constraint. And I think the key thing is it says in this article here is what you need is fluidity in the system. In other words, you need cargo continually moving. What's happening now is we're not having an issue in the ports, really. I mean, the ships are coming in. Yes, there are backlogs off U.S. ports, L.A., Long Beach, Savannah, Houston, New York, New Jersey. But the issue isn't offloading the vessels. The problem is moving them out of the terminals on land into the interior system. That's where we're having this issue. And we're going to talk more about containers in a minute. But again, 24-7 works if you can do it. Now, I still think that if you can get the big operators, the Amazons, the, the Ikeas, the Targets, those who import a lot of containers to kick up 24-7 operations, then that starts alleviating a lot of pressure on the ports. It, it's not a huge percentage, but if they can set the, the model and start alleviating some of that backlog, it's a little bit easier on the ports. So I think General Lyons has got a good point here. The problem is it involves a lot of multiple parts and it is a lot more than sitting there saying 24 seven is the answer. Again, back in September, I sat there and said that that was BS that you can't just get the ports going, you gotta get the entire system going. And that's the thing we forget, containers on ships are only one element in the entire intermodal system. And you gotta look at road, rail, aviation, you name it, when you start talking about cargo throughput, because that's the big issue. All right, story number two takes us to the Black Sea and the situation regarding Ukraine and grain. This is our buddies at Marine Traffic's latest map here on traffic in and out of the Black Sea. So a couple of things to notice here of what's going on. Number one, visibility has increased on ships sailing across the Sea of Azov here. You'll see most, almost all these vessels are Russian, sailing from the Kerch Straits up to Rostov on the Don. Uh, you hadn't seen these vessels really turning on their AIS, but now we're seeing it. We're seeing those vessels tracking commercially here. And there's two reasons I think they're doing this. Number one, I think they want visibility on themselves so that they're not going to get struck by Ukrainian attacks. They want them to be squawking. Yeah, I know it raises their visibility and the Ukrainians can track them now. But I think that what they want to do is make sure there's not an incidental attack. And so they're going to claim that they are showing their AIS. In other words, they're not running dark. Second, I think they also want to open the idea that it's okay to be moving ships. If we're moving ships freely through the Sea of Azov, then the Ukrainians can start moving their vessels out of the Gulf of Odessa. You will notice that there are no vessels in the Gulf of Odessa. And if we zoom in here just a little bit, we still have this huge, massive anchorage off the Danube right there with ships going into the Danube. We've seen vessels come out of Ukraine, out of the ports of Odessa, but most of the ships we've seen so far are vessels that have been stuck in those ports. Uh, and it's these ports right here. It's the cluster of three ports right here where they're coming out of. And what we're seeing is vessels clearing out of those ports. And most of those vessels had already been either loaded or basically just stuck into these ports. And we're seeing them come out now. But a couple of key stories right here, Reuters story on G Captain, uh, Ukraine grain exports obstacles to easing the global food crisis. So one of the things that they're doing right now is they're talking about what has been exported. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I've been tracking the vessels coming out as ships come out. So about 370,000 tons of product has come out through those ports, mainly corn has come out. A lot of this cargo had been loaded on the vessels prior to them sailing. So they were sitting there with cargo or they're being loaded. Now, the other issue is they had to get crews back on these vessels. A lot of these ships either didn't have full crews on board or were put into a cold layup. And so it took some time to get the ships up and running. But there's still an estimated 3 million tons of grain in the ports that need to move. Uh, it raises the question of, will this alleviate the food crisis? Well, Ukraine has about 20 million tons of grain. That needs to move. And we would have to start seeing those moving. They're not moving right now. Understand what we're seeing here is drips and drabs. It's not a continuous flow of vessels. And what we're not seeing is ships going into these ports. There's been one that went up there, but we haven't seen anything else. We still have the issue with escorting these vessels. These ships are sailing individually. They're, they're pulling a Captain Phillips, not a Greyhound. I use the analogy from a Tom Hanks movies. And what we're seeing is the ships are sailing independently by themselves. We're not seeing escorts. We're not getting reports 
of any escorts, but they're sailing through clear channels, supposedly free of mines, but we know mines have broken loose, which means that there is always the incidental here for vessels to hit mines. Insurance, the Joint Coordination Center of the JCC, which is operated in Istanbul, is working to clear vessels to head up there. But one of the things we saw is the July 22nd agreement with Lloyd's of uh, London insurer Ascot and a broker. They set up a marine cargo war insurance for this with about $50 million of coverage for each voyage. Now, remember, this is going to be dependent. War risk insurance is different than H&M, Hull and Machinery, and P&I Protection Indemnity. So you would have to find a, a shipper, a cargo carrier who's willing to basically risk their ship or that 50 million will cover. 50 million will not cover large bulkers. And so you're really restricting to medium-sized vessels and vessels probably that are much older and therefore not as expensive. Uh, talking about the crews here too, uh, a lot of issues with crews. They will get crews. They're just going to have to pay them more to probably do this but they'll probably be able to do that. Again, a lot of the, the, the ships are unmanned or remanning at this time coming up. Uh, the stakes, uh, again, I, I think this is a big issue re regarding the potential here for food issues around the world, particularly in Africa, which is su suffering. And how might the deal slow global food inflation? I think as of right now, it has done very little to do that. The amount of cargo coming out here is not a lot. Both Ukraine and Russia have agreed to allow this. And in turn, the Russians are hoping, again, not to see interference with their ships. We're seeing ships sailing out of the ports. We've seen this. But we're also having issues. The very first ship to sail, which is the Sierra Leone flagged Razoni, was supposed to go to Tripoli in Lebanon. But the group that basically was shipping the cargo has rejected the cargo. Now that could be because the cargo has sat in the ship for five months and therefore isn't good anymore. It, it's not exactly clear. It's, we are not seeing the Ukrainian ports wide open, open for business. That has not happened yet. And again, the recent exchanges between Ukraine and Russia, we just had saw an attack on a Russian airfield in Crimea, for example. There is always the potential for escalation. And unfortunately, these commercial ships are going to be caught right in the middle if that happens. All right, let's jump over to story number three. Story number three takes us over to freight waves and Greg Miller. No precipitous plunge in container shipping rates, just orderly decline. So the container market is, again, it's been amazing to watch over the past couple of years. And one of the things we're seeing right now, for example, is freight rates have really not bottomed out like some people have thought. Here is the Freitos Baltic Index from China to the North American West Coast. And one of the things you'll see here is while it was at a record high here, over 20,000, it has come down, but not as fast. As a matter of fact, what we're seeing here is a plateauing, kind of a, a, a shifting. One of the things we are seeing is the East Coast, which is substantially higher, is also holding. We know a lot of cargo is shifting over to the East Coast. It's moving through the Panama Canal on Neo Panamax vessels. Matter of fact, we just had the largest Neo Panamax vessel go through the canal at over 16,000 TEU, just an amazing number of, uh, of, of containers going through. But it's also coming on those ultra large container vessels through the Suez and shifting over into feeder vessels. And you're sitting there going, well, why would you go to the East Coast if it's so much more? Then the West Coast, well, number one, dependability. Uh, you're not <coughs> having the issue that you had on the West Coast last year. And more importantly, uh, we're seeing diversification. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, shippers moving their cargo intakes into multiple ports, not just putting everything into LA and Long Beach. And you see that. Uh, this is the World Index, and even the World Index is kind of holding. This is the Shanghai to New York right here. Everything seems to be indicating that rates are fairly well stabilized at this point. There's not a huge drop off the cliff. Now, that will change after the, the second half of 2022, as we go, into, uh, go out of winter in the spring of 2023. Then that's probably the next time you're going to see freight rates drop because that's the normal time when freight demand decreases. But one of the interesting things here is in all these stories is number one, 
Container liners are still making record profit. I know we talked a lot, uh, had a video where we talked about, are we heading to a global freight recession? Again, right up here. That came after the story from Craig Fuller over at Freight Waves talking about that, where he saw the decline in truck freight and basically sat there and said, okay, this is going to happen in ocean freight, expecting to see a, a plunge off a cliff in July, which we haven't seen. And matter of fact, what you're seeing here is the second quarter numbers are coming in for all the container carriers and they're high. I mean, they're really, really high. I mean, we're seeing record profits here across the board. And we're seeing that story in uh, uh, G Captain, see it same here on Splash 24 7. We're seeing it in numbers in the port. Port of Savannah is on pace for 6 million TEUs, uh, had a record July coming in, and it's not just them. Long Beach had a record. Uh, all these are happening. And what we're seeing here is a lot of movement. Everybody expected the, because of the economic recession and return back to work, we were going to see freight drop. But what we're seeing again here is a lot of cargo is coming across. And I think, again, my personal opinion on this is that we're seeing a lot of cargo come across because really retailers don't know what consumers want. And because it's better to stockpile in warehouses, which is what they're doing and in ports, we're seeing a lot of freight coming over. What's keeping the freight rates high right now is a couple of factors. So for example, labor issues, UK's biggest container port to be hit by eight days of strike, Felix Stowe is about to have it. We already see it in Hamburg right now. We still have no contract signed between the ILWU and the PMA on the West Coast of the United States. And we keep seeing issues that raise the issue here about, is the supply chain system back to normal? And it's not, and it's not. And, and this is having an impact across it. We're also seeing a lot of issues within the container carry system itself. So for example, a story went under the radar, but a really interesting one, C-SPAN parent Atlas Corporation received a buyout offer from controlling shareholders plus O&E. So C-SPAN is not a ocean carrier. It's not one of the big nine or 10, if you throw Zim in there. What they are basically a U-Haul. They lease and rent vessels to the ocean carriers. Uh, they build vessels, uh, they lease them out, and they're what's known as an NOO, a non-ocean, uh, a non-owner operator. So these nodes basically lease their vessels out, and C-SPAN is one of the biggest ones. What's interesting about these things, if you follow Jay Mintzmeyer and a few others who do the stocks on shipping, is these companies are really in a good position because they have leases and contracts out for a long time, enough to cover the cost of building the vessels. And if you assume 15 to 20 year lifespans of these vessels, they're in good economic shape. I am just shocked that no one has made a move on Atlas before this. Uh, I really am because they were ripe for a, a takeover bid. Uh, and that's kind of what we're seeing right now. The other issue you have is really the push against the big ocean carriers. We've seen it with the Federal Maritime Commission and their uh, effort to really monitor ocean shipping and the growth of them. Talked about that last week in What the Ship, but this story from uh, Addis Agin over at Splash 24-7, EU seeks feedback on antitrust exemption on liner shipping consortia. This means that the European Union is looking at the big container liners. And when you go to the video I did on the share of the ocean alliances in how much percentage of, of, of ocean freight they carry from Asia to the United States, North America, and to Europe, one of the things you see is they really dominate that trade. Again, that video is right here. You're free to go take a look at it. But one of the things we talk about there is the ocean alliances, the three big ones, 2M, the alliance, and ocean alliance control really the freight going from Asia to the United States and to Europe. And now you see the EU wanting to take a look at that. Uh, that's going to give the ocean carriers a lot of concern. Matter of fact, we're hearing from the ocean carriers right now, hey, we've had a great second quarter, a great first half of 2022, but things are going to slow down. We're expecting to see profits. HMM, just like hair on fire screaming that things are going to go bad. I, I just think they're they're, they're not ready for the decline in their windfall profits. And uh, I also think HM, HMM is dealing with takeover bids. And so they're trying to sit there and say they may not be the best deal to get is, is buying them. 
Uh, they, they like their deal right now with operating under the Korean government. Gives them a lot of flexibility. So uh, the ocean carriers are, are going to be screaming and the World Shipping Council will be screaming that, OK, things are coming down. But again, they're at pretty good levels. And I think one of the things we're going to be seeing is what third and fourth quarter looks like going forward. But expect to see the precipitous fall in the beginning of 2023. We were talking about this a year ago where we sat there and said, listen, 2022 is going to be a good year. They're going to have a record year. We knew they were going to have a good year. But 2023 is going to be the one where really you start separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. All right, let's jump over to story number four. Story number four takes us over to the tanker market. Now, again, I always like try to diversify our, our stories a bit. So I want to come over here to the tanker market. Bloomberg story over on GCAP and tanker market sees strongest market in 25 years. Uh, again, a lot of factors are at play here, not the least of which is Russia, Ukraine and the disruptions in Russian fuel hitting the market. Now, I would argue that the Russians are doing everything they can to get around this. Ship to ship transfers are taking place, uh, a lot working on here. But for right now, product tankers and product tankers are clean tankers. These are the ones that move gasoline, diesel, not crude oil. Uh, once you put crude oil in a ship, it, it, it's kind of like putting coffee in your mug. You know, you've ruined the mug. It, it's just it's always going to taste a little bit like it. it's the same thing with crude oil. You can clean a crude oil tanker. It takes a long time to do it. But uh, but we're seeing right here this 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 record profits. And if you build on this, Greg Miller did a, a story right here in Freight Waves talking about this, uh, looking at the shipping stocks and looking at this. One of the things you're seeing is how the tanker market is really the winner from the beginning of the year. Tanker markets is just up compared to dry bulk stock and container stocks. Definitely seeing an increase here. But again, it's container, container stocks are down over the year. Uh, dry bulk is just up a tick. We saw that big, huge plunge here recently, and now they're back on the uptick, which I can't understand still. It's just this weird system that the the market would just for some reason drag down the the bulkers with the rest of the market but tankers are starting to see an uptick and if you look at where tankers have been historically man they've been on the bottom for a long time you look at companies like osg overseas shipping group uh just really the potential for a lot of growth and you're seeing that particularly in that product tanker market right there you see how the stocks have really ticked up in the tanker market and how shipping stocks have done basically overall here. And the, he took this all the way back to January of 2020. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that uh, lots of gas, but not enough ships out there. This is talking about the LNG trade. This is a sea trade uh, story, talking about it by Paul Bartlett, uh, talking about the fact that there's not enough LNG carriers out there right now. Uh, we saw China really free up a lot of LNG carriers, but now they're back to taking it. And especially as we start heading to winter, this is going to be a big problem. Uh, and then this story also by Greg Miller talks about the war effects on the crude tanker system, long lasting and just beginning uh, Euronav, TK, which are big crude oil carriers, are seeing the post-invasion trade pattern sticking. And again, as, as Greg always does, he uh, does some great graphics where he starts talking about how that crude is. We're, we're seeing that Diminishment of crude oil coming out of Russia, that decrease 700,000 barrels per day. And who's picking it up? Where's it going? It's coming out of the United States. It's coming out of South, Af uh, South America. It's coming out of Africa. It's coming out of the Mid Middle East. Uh, uh, Russia is shifting where it's selling that oil. It's not shifting, but it's shifting more into South Asia, over into China. And one of the things to understand here is you have to understand not just tons, not just barrels per day, but ton miles. Shipping 700,000 barrels out of Russia into Europe is pipeline, it doesn't really involve tankers. But when you start shifting 800,000 barrels per day to India, to South Asia, that's tankers. And now you're shifting this and tankers go by ton miles. How many tons per mile you're shipping? And the longer the voyage is, the more tankers you need. And that becomes the big issue. And ton miles are the measurement people should be looking at, not just tons, ton miles. How far do you have to ship that cargo? That's the big thing. That's what decreases your throughput. You know, if you had a tanker and it could make six voyages a year, 
on a route, but now that route is twice as long. Well, now you're only making three voyages. And so what that means is you've got to either increase the cost of transportation to cover that, uh, and that drives up price. And that's what we start talk about when we talk about ton miles. Very important in ocean shipping to understand that. All right, let's go to our last story, story number five. Story number five takes us to East Asia and China and Taiwan. I would have dropped a video on this while I was on vacation, but I had a couple of issues with uh, filming. Uh, the the uh, video I did last week took a long time to do based on the uh, equipment I had with me and also available internet. So it was really tough to do something on the road. Really need to improve uh, my uh, kind of uh, mobile uh, studio with me. But this story was really interesting. This had to deal with Speaker of the House Pelosi's visit to Taiwan and Taiwan's decision to basically saber rattle by conducting a series of military exercises in and around the island of Taiwan, which understand navies can do this. They just have to declare where they're doing these military exercises. You just can't do it within territorial waters. Territorial waters are declared as 12 miles from uh, a nation. Uh, so uh, as long as you don't exceed that, you're fine. But China decided to initiate this all around Taiwan on six main routes coming in and out of the islands. And they fired a series of crews and ballistic missiles into the water. And there was a lot of talk about this. Uh, and it required you know, ships to uh, uh, divert at different times from this. But understand, that's a change of course. It's a couple of hours, maybe, in transit time, some extra fuel cost. It was close to Taiwan, and don't get me wrong, it had some impact in Taiwan. Some vessels decided to hold off before coming into port. There's some issues with this, I, I, I have to say. Number, the, number one is it's very hard for us to make an argument about violation of territorial waters because that refers to UNCLAWS, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, a, a agreement we have not ratified as the United States. So that's a problem. You know, the saber rattling Greg Miller story here talks about it too. And understand that it's a heavy trafficking route. I mean, the East Asia, the, the area around Taiwan is densely, densely packed with vessels. And, you know, announcing, you know, Pelosi announcing that trip, it would have been better if she just showed up. Codells, these congressional delegations can go wherever they they want. It, it created a lot of talk. I mean, this piece over in Maritime Executive, why a blockade of Taiwan would be disastrous for China. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting, I, I have to say, is again, I'm on Twitter a lot. And so I see a lot of people, but there was a guy on Twitter who has a huge following. I mean, a million subscribers. And he made this point about, well, who cares if they blockade Taiwan? It, it won't blockade data. Well, number one, first off, a blockade would severely impact Taiwanese economy, obviously. But two, he didn't understand how data is moved. You know, these, these live fire exercises are, are pretty important. You see them all around the island of Taiwan here. But this person, and I, I'm not going to name him, uh, basically sat there and said, well, you can't blockade Taiwan from data. And it's like, yes, you can, because 99% of the world's data moves not through the air, but on submarine cables, cables that are laid under the ocean. And when you look at someone like Taiwan, for example, and again, we'll zoom in here to give you a look. Uh, this, by the way, is, is uh, a site called submarinecablemap.com. Great site. It shows you all these underwater cables right here. Here is Taiwan. And you'll see there are four major hubs that come in, two on the north side of the island, one on the northeast side of the island, and one on the southern chain of the island. And when you look at these areas right here, they the military zones are right over these submarine cables. Uh, China knows how to fish these cables up and sever them if they do. This is standard war plan operations, is to sever communications in this. Understand in World War I, the British Royal Mail Service, the mail, went out into the Dover Straits and fished up three German submarine cables in 1914 and sawed them in half to cut Germany off from its colonies in Africa. Uh, this would be considered absolutely essential. Uh, Taiwan would be severed from this. Now, I immediately got 
comments back sitting there saying, well, you know, you don't understand how data moves, you know, because there are satellites and, 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 you know, in Ukraine, they're using, uh, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Elon Musk Starlake. Well, number one, first of all, look at the amount of data moves by Starlink versus what moves via submarine fiber optic cable. And you get the idea. It's like, okay, yeah, you're moving data, but not the same thing. It's like moving cargo by an F-150 versus a semi. It's You're moving cargo, but not as fast and not as big. Believe me, I just went through this in Hawaii. Uh, it, it's not the same thing. And if you sever those submarine cables, that would be an effective blockade system. Blockade does not need to be of ships seeming off the surface anymore. Understand, the world's ocean floors are just as important as the top of the ocean. And that's a big issue we saw. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. It's great to be back and to be back. You'll see new episodes popping up here every few days on select stories and topics, including some new features that I'm working on right now. So if you enjoyed today's episode, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you can, head on over to Patreon and become a patron of this channel. That helps me put these videos out and it provides support to the channel. And if you don't want to become a yearly member by patron, then just go right below to the super thanks button, hit that super thanks button, and you can make a contribution directly to what's going on with shipping. To our next episode, it's great to be back. Mahalo.